Welcome back to the Investing Millennial. Today we're going to be looking at different types of investments, whether that be through a brokerage, on your own, or through some type of affiliate company. We're going to be looking at the different things that you can put your money in to grow your wealth and to grow your income. And this is very important because you're able to diversify and just kind of find things that you like and work with your lifestyle, and that is key. On this channel, we're going to be focusing mainly on things in the stock market through a brokerage. But if you find one of these other options to be something that you're interested in or you think it fits your lifestyle better, definitely follow that passion or follow that route because you'll end up with a lot more success than trying to jump into something you're not as comfortable with. All right, let's get to the first one. So the first type of investment that we are going to be looking at are stocks. Stocks are the most common and most talked about and most seen investments out there. It's what your 401k um, is based off of. It's what your mutual funds are based off of. The, the economy is based off of it. Stocks are the base of pretty much everything. It's they're, they're easily seen. They're easily there. And they're easy to follow and chart. Uh, so basically what a stock is, it is ownership of a company that is publicly traded. That is a public company where anyone in the public can claim ownership. And the definition listed is stocks are an equity investment that represents part ownership in a corporation and entitles you to part of that corporation's earning and assets. Like I said, it just pretty much says you own the company and when the company thrives, you make money off that uh, growth. And when the company falls, you obviously, you are part of that fall. So that, that's what a stock is. Um, they can be bought, so they can be longed. Or they can be shorted, so they can be sold before ownership, and then you buy. You're playing the downplay since you're the short. So you can play it long, you can play stock short, you can play them both ways. Um, dividends can be earned off of certain stocks, and dividends is a nice fixed income where you have something coming in every quarter, and it's based off of how many stocks you own. Usually, you find most dividends around two percent, percent and a half, two percent. Which is nice. So, if you have a hundred thousand dollars, then you get two thousand dollars a year just because you own the stock. And then, whenever the stock grows, you also make that earnings on top of it. Um, they historically outperform most other investments in the long run. So, stocks tend to have a higher growth, especially in now and twenty eighteen. Tech stocks are just uh, balls to the wall. You know pedal to the metal they are growing insane you got amazon growing 60 percent just over the summer and just companies like that amd almost doubling this year and expected to double again this year there's just a lot more growth and it just simply goes off of volatility stocks have a higher chance to grow and they actually have a higher chance of falling too so it's gonna go both ways with stocks so but there is safer stocks and then there is more risky volatile stocks and that's where you got to find your niche within that. Um, they can be intraday traded or held for years. So you can trade a stock. You buy it at 831. You can sell it at 832. Or you can buy a stock back in 1940 and still have it today. Uh, so there really is no time limit on stocks. And the reason I mention this, you'll see that some uh, uh Investments have like expiration dates on them. They have a certain time zone on them. And it's just important to know that. So stocks allow for more flexibility. It's probably the most flexible investment. Uh, but it's something to be really careful of. A company can go bankrupt and you're the last to be paid out. So say Kmart came out when bankrupt or even GM when GM went bankrupt back in 2008. Uh, all their shareholders lost all their money. It's just how it is. And you might get a slight chunk of that money if it gets paid out again. But it's very unlikely that you'll see anywhere near what the money you put in. You'll luckily get a fraction back just because you're the last person of all people to be paid back the money. All right, now to move on to our next one. So you might be familiar with bonds because you heard about war bonds during your history class. Or you talked about or you heard your grandpa talk about bonds or you were given a bond as a gift when you were young or when you were born. A lot of people give them 
And essentially what a bond is, or by definition, it is a debt security under which the issuer owes the holder a debt and, depending on the terms of the bond, is obliged to pay them interest, the coupon, and the coupon just represents that you will literally get a coupon out of a paper and you can go purchase a bond with it, or to repay the principal at a later date uh, termed the maturity date. And what this is saying is a bond is essentially a debt. And what you do with this debt is you um, you give money to a company or a corporation or to someone and they have to pay you back interest and they have to pay you back fully what the debt was depending on the maturity date or the date established. A lot of times these are 5 year, 10 year, 30 year uh, loans essentially to someone. They can be done with the government, they can be done with private companies, they can be done with literally anyone. And so it is, it's a very safe form of investment, especially done with the government. Essentially for the bond to fail, the government would have to go bankrupt, which I feel like we're in a whole lot of different issue besides your bond failing if that were to occur. Um, they have a, an exact date to when the loan has to be paid back in full. So you have a date, and like you said, these do get paid back unless the company fails. They're very strict on that SEC is. So it's a fixed income source due to the interest. So this is like a true form of passive income. And so if you want that passive income, you stick money in bonds and you'll get it every single uh, six months. So usually biannual, they're paid out or they get paid out yearly, but most commonly biannual. Um, average interest has gone down a lot. and It's only roughly around 2.5% currently, which is only slightly above inflation rate. So you're still making a profit on it past inflation. But it could be doing a lot better, essentially, compared to all, all other um, available options for uh, investments. And, like I said, if the company goes bankrupt, you're stuck. Um, actually, you get paid out before the stockholders. So you're more likely to get your money back, which is good. But to expect your money to be fully paid back is unlikely. But you're better off than if you were to own the stock compared to the stockholders, which are below you. All right, we're going to move to the next one. So now we are going to look at options. And what options are, are a contract to buy stocks at a certain price, which is labeled the strike price. And what you do is the contracts are 100. It is set to buy 100 stocks. And you don't have to exactly execute these uh, options or these contracts. When you can simply trade the contracts. All we can do is you can execute the contracts if you have enough money to get a discounted price on the stocks. So the way options work is you create a contract with someone saying, I want to buy 100 shares of this stock. And it's usually on the third day or the third week or the third month. It usually ends in a three on when these are executed, but they can be traded anytime in between that time. And so let's say the stock today is $100, but you want to buy a contract saying you want to buy the stock at $95. So it's considered in the money. And someone selling that contract or selling that option believes it's going to fall below that $95. So you're betting that it's going to be over $95 and you're going to make the difference between $95 and what it's going to be when the execution date is. And the person selling you things can be the opposite. So they think you're going to overpay for a stock and they're going to make the difference on it. So that's how these work. And so they work both ways. And the price of an option is dictated by how far away it is from the current price. So let's go back to our $100 uh, example. So if you are going to say you're going to buy stocks at $105, so that's out of the money, meaning it has to go past that mark for you to be making a profit those contracts are extremely cheap because what you do is you pay a fee for the contract and then you pay a fee per uh, share which is usually really cheap farther out of the money it is and more expensive usually in the money it is and so you can buy these uh, like I said it's a hundred dollars at a time but you can buy multiple contracts and so there's very high upside on these when they're not executed or traded before the execution date because you're selling a lot of stocks 
but with a really small or discounted buy-in price. When you execute it, you got to make sure you have enough money to be able to clear the price of buying the stock. So you have to be careful with that. And you got to make usually make sure you have enough and there's enough volatility and enough volume to move these contracts around if you're simply trading the contracts and not trading the executions on it. So options are a great way if you don't have a lot of money, if you don't have a lot of money in your account and you're just trying to make some really high margin, really high profit trades. But with that comes risk. So I said because options are a lot smaller area or investment arena than stocks so you got to make sure there's enough volume there so i recommend only trading options that are a bigger companies like amazon and apple and i definitely recommend not i repeat not doing binary options you'll see a lot of ads for these on youtube or on different social media websites they are extremely difficult and they are the equivalent of a slot machine but just to kind of go over what a binary option is, it's not an option contract. It's simply a $100 bet. So it's a bet. You're not buying or selling anything that a stock is going to be a certain price at a certain time. So avoid binary options if you hear that because it's very risky and it can cause you to lose a lot of money extremely quick because it's a lot of chart analysis to do it. And most of the guys are usually wrong to do these chart analysis because they do it on such quick quick trades where they do it by like the minute and the hour so options are fine especially if you know what you're doing and this can only be done with a brokerage account definitely do a lot of research you're going to do options but a great way if you don't have a lot of money and you're trying to do a really quick income remember it's higher risk though all right let's go to the next one okay mutual funds We've all heard of mutual funds. What a mutual fund is, by definition, is an investment vehicle made up of a pool of money collected from many investors for the purpose of investing in securities such as stocks, bonds, money market instruments, and other assets. To put it plainly, a mutual fund is a collection that all investors buy in. A mutual fund is great because it's usually a discounted price. So let's say a mutual fund is... $80 a share because usually it works off like a stock base where it's per share and what you do is you can gain access to Apple, Amazon, Facebook, NVIDIA, a whole bunch of tech stocks by buying this mutual fund where you normally really couldn't afford that many stocks to make it worth it. And so it allows you to diversify your portfolio with a simple click of a button or just buying one share instead of actually going out and buying all the different shares to diversify. And what that also does, that incurs a lot of cost between commission fees and transaction fees. But the thing with mutual funds is they're traded after hours, which is susceptible to midday news and obviously pre and post news. So a mutual fund cannot be sold or bought until the day has ended. And so this means that you might want to sell a mutual stock a certain day but it can't happen until that 3 o'clock central time or 4 o'clock eastern time until that bell has rung in the stock market that cannot be executed. And so this allows for a lot of things to happen on during the midday which can be good or can be bad because stocks tend to teeter or fall towards the end of the day because people are selling that are stock trading compared to mutual trading. So you tend to not get the full benefit of the day or riding stock sideways because you have to ride it through the entire day. But it's a plus because it also keeps you secure and it keeps you less emotional and stops you from acting very suddenly just due to something. Um, there's, very, there's a lot of different variety in this sector because you can choose index funds. So things like the S&P 500, Dow Jones, NASDAQ, Russell, all of that. But you can also choose things that are like housing, or I want technology, or I want small cap, large cap, foreign. I want a mix of everything. You can really mix up mutual funds to satisfy how you feel, and you can research these. They tend to have a good rate of return. Usually a good growth stock, which has a lot of uh, like tech stocks in it and more stock-based than anything else. 12 to 15% annually, which is double what a 401k usually returns on average. So the growth is significantly higher, and these are also managed by a professional. So it essentially takes you 
out of the equation, which can be good or bad, because sometimes an individual makes a lot of mistakes, especially starting because they're very emotional about their money and they don't understand how the market is truly acting. And the professional can act on their behalf. But the problem with also mutual funds is they have to keep a lot of cash stockpiled on the side. So they tend to be extremely conservative and they can miss a lot of sudden jumps or they can miss a lot of sudden bull markets due to this. But your money is more protected in this sector. But there are more fees to this, whether it be commission or some sort of interest fee that correlate with that. But you can see that per mutual fund. You do your research and you can see what their fees are, if they're free of fees or whatever it is. All right, let's go to the next one. So an ETF or an exchange traded fund is probably not something you heard of before. But what it is, it's a marketable security that tracks an index of commodity, bonds, or a basket of assets like an index fund. But unlike mutual fund, an ETF trades like a common stock on a stock exchange. So an ETF is essentially a mutual fund, but it, it acts differently. It acts, like it says, like a common stock. And what that means is that the price constantly changes throughout the day. It's not end day like mutual fund. It's consistently through the day, just how a normal stock would look. And you're allowed to trade these the same way. And their fees are slightly different based off of that, or sometimes they're even free. And, or the fees are simply the commission per trade on them. And so I like ETFs. You want to be more active investor, but you want the diversity of a mutual fund. So it sort of plays the happy medium between stocks and mutual funds and this allows you to really diversify a portfolio without a lot of money and it allows you to buy a lot of stocks without a lot of money which is good it allows you to do it and when you're really starting out and as a security blanket uh, indirectly you own the assets meaning you don't directly own the stock in the company you don't own the ownership in the company but you're simply trading the stocks through the ETF so the ETF itself owns the ownership and then you own a part of that ETF that you are trading. So that's sort of how that works. It's a little bit confusing or awkward, but it is, the ETF simply acts like the middleman and they have the true ownership. And then you're simply trading the ownership that you own in that ETF to other investors. But the ETF correlates to those stocks. So the biggest thing to take away from that is you don't get to do the voting so stocks will have you vote on things because you're technically an owner or a board member so you get to vote on things you like or CEOs or certain executive positions and ETF you don't get to do that ETFs pay off their own dividends but you do not get the dividends from the stocks um, and so ETFs also unlike mutual funds can be long they can be shorted and they can be bought on margin or a mutual fund can only be longed. So it just adds a little bit more variety and versatility to these things, especially when you see markets in certain ways. All right, now you know a little bit about ETFs. Let's go to the next one. So I sort of threw a curveball in here for you guys and we're going to talk about real estate. And the reason why I talk about real estate is it's a great driver for investment and it's a great driver for passive income. And what real estate is, it's the purchase, ownership, lease, or sale of land or any structure on it for the purpose of earning money. Real estate generally breaks down three categories, residential, commercial, and industrial. And what I do is I highly recommend residential and commercial. They can be started on smaller scales, unlike industrial. In residential, you can obviously live in a home you rent, which is great, which cuts down on your cost. And something I truly recommend if you can pull it off buy a duplex and rent out the other half and you essentially get to live for free which is great because it cuts down a huge cost of living and then you can go and invest that money and when you're ready you can either sell that duplex or you rent out your side and move into your bigger home but let's focus on real estate a little bit here so it can also be purchased through crowdfunding to avoid landlording so people worry about real estate about being landlords and hiring managing companies well you can simply invest in real estate for someone else to be your landlord 
and what this is is you or a group of people give someone who wants to be the landlord or who owns the management company money that he's going to pay you interest with or he's going to pay you a portion of his monthly earnings that he receives based on the percentage of money you provided to him for an apartment complex. And so this allows you to own property without actually owning property, which can be nice if you have enough money and you can essentially buy a huge, large, thousand-unit apartment complexes, but yet you don't landlord them and you're not on the bill, essentially, if it goes bankrupt. You don't get affected. You lose that money you invest in, but you're not getting hit with all the other stuff. It, um, so when you buy a building, you also build equity while having passive income. So when you buy a house that is a liability when you buy a house and rent it that's an asset so the liability house that you own and live in gains equity yes but you're also depreciating it by living in it and you're not gaining income every month unlike the other one where it gains equity but you're also gaining that passive income and so when anyone says their house is their greatest asset they are very wrong and I don't think they truly understand the definition of asset. The only home that's an asset is one that is rented. The problem with real estate though is also it is very costly to get into because you usually need 20 to 30 percent down on a home to be able to rent it or any type of multi-residential or apartment or anything like that. And with homes costing quarter million dollars or more that can get very expensive when you're talking forty, fifty thousand dollars down and no true expectation of profit, there's a lot of risk in that and uncertainty, especially when you're very new to it. So if you're gonna get into this, I highly recommend taking classes. Um, the problem also is you have to be on call twenty four seven unless you hire someone, which obviously eats in the process profits, but it becomes more of a business at that point where you simply own a business that owns homes. Instead of you solely owning homes, which also comes with a lot of other benefits when you start owning LLCs and a lot of tax deferences, which we'll definitely get in at some point because I think it's definitely worth it. Everyone should have an LLC, and it's the reason why Warren Buffett only pays himself a dollar and pays less taxes than his secretary. It's simply because he buys everything through his company, and he actually doesn't own anything himself except for his house, which he bought for and paid off. Um, another thing with real estate is majority of millionaires are created through real estate. So most millionaires out there, I, th I would say 60-65% have done it through real estate. And it's very easy because if you think about it, if you own three to four homes, just to equity the home is in the million to dollar range. And millionaire doesn't mean you own a million dollars a year you earn. It just simply means your net worth is over a million dollars, which can be done very easily through real estate. And it's important to know that, like, yes, you can sell all those homes and you're still generating that profit and you're a millionaire. You could probably live very comfy, but don't let that millionaire title, like, throw you one way or another. It just simply means your net worth is that and owning homes in a nice way of reaching that title quickly. And there's also many different options and categories to choose from real estate, which is nice because it allows for a lot of diversity and a lot of different uh, types and areas that you can go into and research and you can find your niche or what works best in your area instead of being stuck with one thing. All right, now we're going to move on to the last one. So here's another one that's a little bit different than what our usual investments are. It's called annuities. And annuities are a very special type of investment. And so an annuity is, is a financial product that pays out a fixed stream. Let me repeat that again. A fixed stream of payments to an individual primarily used as an income stream for retirees. An emphasis on retirees. you got to understand that, and I'll show you why. So it's a steady cash flow for life, but it doesn't necessarily get paid out to you but it does get paid to you, okay? So Social Security is a type of annuity because Social Security pays you out every month or they pay you bi-weekly, but usually every month, I believe, once you reach a certain age and they'll pay you at that out until you die or until I think the money that you've built up. I'm not totally familiar with Social Security, but Social Security is considered an annuity. 
Uh, one of the main ones, though, that I know well about is life insurance. And usually you get this through like a Northwest Mutual type of life insurance. And what it is, it usually has a rate about 5 to 6%. And what the life insurance does is, so say the premium on the life insurance is $200 a month, but instead you give them $300. So that extra $100 that you give them, or whatever money's over the premium in this example, it's $100. They put into the separate account that then they will pay you 5% a year out on. And so if you put large chunks of money, usually they tell lottery winners to do this. Or people who come across large amounts of money due to like inheritance or anything like that. To put money here because it's super safe. The only way this could ever fail is if Northwest Mutual were to go bankrupt. And it's a very large company and they have a lot of safe locks where it most likely won't happen. But that's how this could fail. It's a bankruptcy thing, just like most other investments. But, so what this does is, essentially you put a large lump of money in there and they pay you out that percentage per year and it can grow compounding too. So it's 5%, 6%, 45 but roughly 5% a year. And you can take the money out just like a bank account. You go and you call them, hey, I need this. Three days later, that check's going to be there waiting for you. And you can put it over into your actual bank account compared to Northwest Mutual's like holding account that they have in it. And along with it, you also have life insurance, which is never a bad thing. Everyone should have life insurance because you don't want to leave your loved ones or anyone off paying your bills or whatever debt you have may have. But you shouldn't have debt. Because we went over it, you got to clear your debt up before you become an investor. That's the big key to being a successful investor. But anyways, you should always just have life insurance, no matter if you have debt or not. And just the annuity's nice. It's usually nice just to have as like a side thing. So you put just money in there and you sort of let it grow at that 5%. And while you do all your other riskier investments. And it's just like another side cash flow. Because when you have your annuity paying you out. You have your 401k paying you out. You have your Roth paying you out. You have Social Security paying you out. And then who knows, you might have a business or whatever. And you have like five income streams when you're retired. You're going to be living like a king then. But this also, like I said, it's it's more made for you to pull it out later than now. And that's how you should do it due to the low um, interest rates on it. A lot higher than any bank account. So you're better off getting life insurance and putting in a savings account. If all the other investments just seem too risky or too hard for you, at least do this. Because then you have, one, a product, and two, you have a safe return that exceeds any savings account. Alright, so that's all the investment terms I think we will ever go over on this channel. And I think it's all the different investments I really think you should look into. I mean, if there's other ones that you guys have, comment down below and we'll look into them. And I'll give you my uh, idea on it, if it's good or risky, bad. Cause I mean, there's other ones. You know, you got your Bitcoin, you got your foreign future markets, you got your foreign markets. That's all different. I don't think that most people on this channel would be quite ready for that. But at a later date, I'm more happy to go over that. But right now, let's stick with these safe, knowledgeable investments that we all can get behind. All right, guys. I'll catch you on the next one. Make sure to like and subscribe. If you want to see something, make sure to comment it down below. And we can go over it, and I'll look into it, and I'll tell you all about it. All right. See you later.